For our scripture reading, I'll be reading from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. James 2, 14 to 18. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if people claim to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Lord's blessings to you, Nelson. Those of you who have attended this church for a long time know that there are themes that I cover at least once a year, and this theme of stewardship is one of those. It's important for us to think about the way we use the resources that God has given us. And so I give you this reminder on a regular basis. Now, sometimes I will talk about creation care. Sometimes I might talk about work, home relationships. Sometimes I might talk about money or finances or material possessions. There's all these different aspects of stewardship that we need to look at from time to time. This morning... The theme is sacrificial giving. And it's interesting because the sub-theme is really what Roland opened with, and that's generosity. And you will see that as we move through this text. We'll pay attention to how our faith plays a role in the ways that we handle the resources God has given us. Now, you might look at this and say, I'm not wealthy. But you know, as well as I do, that in relation to the rest of the world, most Americans are wealthy. As North Americans, we can easily forget that we have so much more than the rest of the world. Really, all that is necessary for life is to have food, shelter, and clothing. And I would suggest that perhaps you might add to that list transportation, especially if you live in an area where there's not public transportation. And so... Based on that, we all have what we need. We literally have everything we need because the things that we don't have are usually wants, not needs. And so most of us, in order to make ends meet from time to time, skip something here or there. We do away with this or that or the other thing. or We don't go out for an extra meal. or All of that is an indication that we are wealthy people. Just on the way to church this morning, I heard a brief story from a woman who started an organization called Skip One. And she's saying, every now and then, skip something, a haircut, a nail, whatever you call it, when you go to the salon, I, I skip those all the time. Um, you know, something that's a little bit of a luxury, skip it and donate that money somewhere to someone who is in need or to an organization that is in need. And so really what this means is that we simply go without some of the luxuries that most of the world doesn't even have. So yes, Americans by, by and large are wealthy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for guiding us this morning. I pray that you would bless my words, that they would minister to each one here. And we ask, Lord, that you would challenge us and encourage us. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to begin with a biblical illustration from Mark 10. It's a pretty long passage, but it's a story. And so it doesn't take a lot of commentary. Starting chapter 10, starting at verse 17 of, of the book of Mark. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell at his knees before him. 
Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I love that little phrase. One thing you lack. So in other words, he's speaking out of love. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Just stop there briefly for a moment. Out of love, Jesus challenges us to consider how we use or misuse our resources. And he knows what it is that we need. And so perhaps it, this might not be our need. You might not have any issue whatsoever, but maybe back on the previous slide, there might have been some issues there that are yours. All this is to say is that Jesus knows the things that are our weaknesses, and that's where he touches our lives and calls us out. And he goes on in this story. Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, teaching moment, how hard it is for rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Wow. Tough words. He's just acknowledging that where we put our trust has everything to do with our relationship with God. Do we trust God or do we trust our money? And if all we trust is our money, that's not going to get us into heaven. He goes on, the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with human beings, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So he just acknowledges that the Spirit can change our hearts. The Spirit can change the ways we act and live and can produce in us a new heart, a heart that cares and gives and is generous. And I love this next verse. Then Peter spoke up. We've left everything to follow you. You know, I don't know if you're like this, but I'm like this. When somebody challenges you, especially on that thing that is your weakness, what's your first reaction? To defend yourself. And Peter's right. They did. These are fishermen who left their nets and followed Jesus. He's in essence saying to Jesus, I think we did enough. Don't be so hard on us. And then Jesus replies, Truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Simply saying, in obedience... When we put Christ first in our lives, we are honored and we are blessed. But then he throws in that little sentence there, along with persecutions. Don't expect life to necessarily be easy just because you decide to follow Jesus. And then he wraps it up. He says, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. You could, you could put it this way. Many who are rich will be last, and the poor will be first. The key text, the one that Roland just read, <clears throat> is a powerful text that reminds us that true faith is expressed in action. In other words, if you just say, 
you believe in Jesus, you just say, well, I'm going to help people sometime along the line, but don't do it. That is not true faith. So let's look at these verses in James 2. Starting at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if people claim to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith save them? And then he gives an illustration to help us think about it. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does, not, does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? Now we're talking about stewardship again. We're talking about use of our resources. If all we do is tell somebody to go and feel better, we've not done anything for them. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And then he says, but someone will say, and this sounds like an argument, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Part of what James is saying is, we tend to want to pit them against each other. One person says, I've got a lot of faith, but they don't do anything about it. And another person says, ah, I don't really have any faith. But they go out and they do something. Instead of pitting them against each other, James wants us to say they always go hand in hand for the believer. So the application this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Again, it's pretty much a story. And it's a story about the Corinthian church, which had been generous and it kind of lost out at some point. They had been helping out churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. And then they stopped. And so Paul is writing to them and saying, reminding them of what their responsibility is. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, in other words, hardships, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Now, the background is that the Corinthian church was wealthy in relation to the Macedonian churches. And yet, the Corinthian church had stopped giving, and these poorer churches who were struggling had continued to give. Now, they were giving to help with the spreading of the gospel. They weren't giving to Paul. This wasn't Paul asking for help, but this was him asking them to help other churches. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, that's the sacrificial giving, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege, get that privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they went beyond our expectations. Having given themselves, first of all, to the Lord, they gave themselves by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, in other words, Paul sent Titus, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled on you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I've never read any writings that do a better job than the Apostle Paul at building people up just before he challenges them. And there he does it. He talks about how they excel in faith and speech and knowledge and earnestness and in love. And so he's saying, add to that generosity or giving. I am not commanding you. In other words, this is not legalism. But I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. 
Last year you were first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. That last little phrase can get lost in this whole story. He's saying, give in proportion to how you've been blessed. So a person who's living on a fixed income might perhaps give 5 or 10%, but a millionaire should probably give 50 or 60% or maybe even more. And those of us who are somewhere in the middle need to consider how God is blessing us and how we can bless other people. It's proportional. For if the willingness is there, that's the heart issue, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So he's saying, you know what? You don't have to worry about what you don't have. But based on what God has given you, you need to be generous with that. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. So he's talking about across the church. If there's need over here and we have excess, we help there. If there's need here and there's excess over there, they help here. He's just trying to say the church is here to help each other and no one should be hurting. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. I love that. In the church is doing its work, everyone's needs are met. Short little illustration to wrap this up this morning comes from Mark 12, verses 41 to 44. I'm sure to many of you this is a very familiar story. Jesus is with his disciples, and he's sitting outside the temple in Jerusalem. And here's the story. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. If you just stop there, you say, wonderful, that's great. We're seeing people being generous and giving. And then he goes on. <clears throat> but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. So if we just have that much of the story, we have huge generosity, and then we have somebody who's not giving much at all. Now, you know the story, but calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty, here's the key, put in everything, all that she had to live on. That's sacrificial giving. This isn't an attempt to make anybody feel guilty. It's not legalism. It's about blessing. It's about generosity. It is about sacrifice. It's also about proportional giving. Giving as God has blessed you. Giving according to the way that you have set up your budget. Hopefully you've set it up in such a way that God gets his portion first. One of the things that June and I have discovered over the years is how much fun it is to be able to give. Now, when you can't give, it is a little more difficult. But when you're able to give abundantly, that's enjoyable. The challenge that I would put before everybody now is when you get your next stimulus check, commit to at least 10% of that going somewhere to someone who has need, a family that you know of, an organization that you know of, a place that is struggling. Take some of that stimulus money and put it there. And my guess is that we will feel blessed as a result. 
The irony is most of us hardly ever have to give sacrificially while we're still being generous. So I leave you with a challenge to take with you this week from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 7. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, And here's the key, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for challenging us. We also thank you for providing for us. And so we ask, Lord, that you would open up doors and windows and open our eyes to see the needs around us so that we can share and be generous. Challenge us to give sacrificially in those situations. I just ask, Lord, that you would help us to see the blessings that we receive as we give. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Nelson. Now is the time for...